video check. Loud and clear. KSL Sports and KSL Podcast present Mode Push, an American view of F1, starting now. Don't stop. He's making cut. Look at Honestly. I've guessed it. I've absolutely guessed it. I enjoyed this so much. Thank you. Thank you. everybody welcome on in it's another edition of mode push the american view of f1 our podcast that has become our baby here ksl sports ksl podcast alex keery and my co-host dan jimenez joining me on the other side of things dan it's been a minute since we've gotten in the uh, lab here it's good to uh good to see you good to, to uh kind of actually we do this over zoom periodically sometimes we get to do it in person but uh it's actually good to see your uh your mug there man so how are things yeah, things are good. Excited to be back, getting getting stoked for a new season. It's uh, just right around the corner. So there's also the new season of Drive to Survive, which is mm. almost as – I mean, this is – I have to pay, like, some reverence to that because this was the thing that got me, um, you know, it got me excited about, about F1 in the first place or even got me kind of introduced to it. And so um, they dropped a a first look today. And because we are total suckers for anything new and shiny, we kind of jumped on this and we said, "Ooh, they've got uh, they've, they've got they've got some content here. Everything's everything's exciting because everything's you know this th- with the DTS stuff, the the Drive to Survive series. I don't know. I everybody has mixed feelings about it because they feel like it's it's fake, right? They feel like there's a lot of production to it. Which you're making a TV show yeah. and you're trying to put it on a on a platform that you're trying to sell subscriptions to. I get it, right? But I mean, it, do you have a problem with the way they've done these things in the past, or, 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 or like how it's how it's kind of worked with with what we've seen in the it, before? Or how, what's your view on this one? Because I, I I just like the way they put it together, and I've been able to kind of peer through the bullcrap uh, over the seasons here. Yeah, I think that in in the end, net net, it's been great for the sport, and you see other leagues that are mimicking it, trying to kind of ride its uh, kind of coattails of success, but. I think as, as serious fans, like we know you, when you watch it, what's kind of been dramatized, what maybe wasn't presented in the exact right chronological order as what actually happened during the season. But <laughs> right. I think in the end, it gives us a window into uh, the part of the sport that we don't see. And, you know, having worked previously in professional racing, it, it feels like uh, a, a bit more real to me because um, it's just like you see the culture of just everybody in the paddock or on the grid knows each other. It's just, a, it's a traveling circus of folks that are, you know, basically your second family. And I think you get a sense of that when you watch drive to survive. So it becomes a lot more meaningful. And then when you watch the races, it feels more enjoyable. So I think uh, it's been a good thing. And uh, you know, there's some things we can chuckle at with Will Buxton and his <laughs> oversimplistic ex- explanations and, you know, it's the dramatization <laughs> of it all, but I, I, I like it. I'm, I'm a fan of it. I love it. I mean, and, and again, I think I, in the first season, I bought into all of the storylines, right? Because you don't know what the difference really is because you can see the way these guys talk. I really did assume that, you know, Max and, and, and Ricardo, may have murdered each other you know they they may yeah. still have tried to kill each other on that uh on the racetrack in monaco it was, i think it was monaco and they ran into each other but uh but at the same time like then you hear later and max hates it like i know he's been pretty vocal about like not wanting to be a part of something that he feel deems is uh you know fake to him or whatever so we what we did get though is we got a dropping of the it's not even a trailer it's a first look which is they are just trying to give us nibbles, right? Of just a couple of things here, and so I've shared the screen with Dan, and we're getting and we're going to watch this at the same time together. So uh, you haven't watched it, I haven't watched it. This is going to be, and so it'll also be interesting too. I might have to actually bleep out later and post some uh, some curses. So maybe they, I don't know. Maybe they don't cuss in the uh, first looks, <laughs> but uh, let, let's see what the. So we're going to be watching this one, and you have to listen along. But you know, you can imagine if you've seen these before. Just to be able to hear some, what some of these are, uh, take a listen to the first look of Season 5 Drive to Survive right here. 2022 represents a new dawn for Formula 1. The biggest overhaul the regulations have ever had. The drivers will love it because they are fighters, like in the Colosseum. How are you feeling about being in the chair? Right. 
there's so much potential for the order to be flipped. It's a step into the unknown. Oh, it wasn't even the full. <laughs> Boy, they really fooled us, Dan. They said it was 45 seconds. It ended at 26, and then uh, <laughs> and then it gave us uh, all the other stuff that we could look forward to. Uh, because if you were into watching that, then you might like Next in Fashion Season 2, also on Netflix. So, uh, <laughs> so I, it, it's... Who knows if even the questions that they were asking were asked at that moment, that they're actually getting the edits, but... Um, and again, they have to balance out the fact that there's going to be new blood watching these things, right? And so they go, "Yeah, we could see the the order totally flipped." And it's just right on cue, Will Buxton telling people, "This racing means everything," you know, <laughs> like a generic <laughs> whatever for us to get excited about it. I don't care. It was uh, it was underwhelming in terms of a of a of a twenty second video because it was a twenty second video. I think. Yeah, yeah, I was wanting more out of that. It <laughs> seems like they're setting it up knowing that, like, hey, for the common fan, this last season was a snooze fest compared to the season prior where it all ended, you know, in, under fireworks. And so they have I think they're kind of trying to uh, uh, beef up the the drama to start the season with all the rules changes. And, you know, I, I we'll, we'll see how it goes, but I, I uh, I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, so we've only gotten te- you know teasers and first looks, and that's about as much as we've gotten so far. So I don't know if we're going to get an actual drop of a uh, of a trailer. We probably will in the next couple of weeks because we're just under a month away from that dropping. And I think what you and I have committed to do here is we're going to – I mean, this is the equivalent of – like having The Bachelor and then recapping episodes of The Bachelor. That's what you and I are going to be to Formula One's Drive to Survive. Is that Which what we've committed there to now? podcasts about that. Yes. And lots of them. There are lots of them. So what we're going to do is if you've never uh, if you've never gotten into it, if you've never watched the show, then what we'll do is we'll kind of pick and choose some of these episodes because it drops the week before uh, that first race of the season. So it's a perfect kind of timing but we'll try to jam in our thoughts on on uh, on a few episodes and kind of give our review of of what had happened there and kind of how close it was to what the reality was. And then we'll also try to uh, kind of preview, obviously, in that second episode. We're, we're, we're going to drop a couple of episodes within a few days of each other of those episodes of Drive to Survive, and then we'll kind of do a race preview uh, going into the season. So, um but first things first, Dan, where do we want to start when we're chatting about uh, what we've got? Because there's there's been nibbles and, and a lot of things that have been going on in the offseason. Generally, though, we just kind of kept away from any news, and that's the way teams like it. Yeah. You know, there's been a lot that's come out over the last few weeks. feels like this has been a, a pretty um, news-filled offseason. I think what's on the top of my mind is team expansion uh, on, on the F1 grid and the news from Andretti and GM Cadillac uh, about their desires to enter the uh, F1 in uh in 2026 which uh i think would be great but is been met with uh pushback from existing teams which i didn't expect so that's kind of been top of my mind what are the biggest pushbacks then because i'll tell you what happened too is during that time i reached out to cadillac and i reached out to andretti uh because i got the uh, we got the press release and i just went straight to those spokes people spokespersons and Mm -hmm. uh and hit them up and said hey we'd love to talk about this and it was really bad timing because it was actually on the day that i think that andretti ended up having to also say we're really bummed by how little people are are respecting the fact that we want to get involved in this and and cadillac kind of put out a similar statement like we're sort of bummed by this and and i know that it's been for the bosses in, in 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 the fia they're not very happy about it either. I mean, I don't know why. Is it because of the shared revenue aspect of it? What would a team, why would somebody not want a global luxury brand that has an American tilt to it be a part of the grid? I don't know what the what the, what the the push would have been uh, against this. This is an expansion of your sport. Yeah, from what I've read, it seems there's two primary reasons for the pushback. Number one is the, the expansion leading to more dilution uh, amongst the existing teams on the shared profits from Formula One than, than they would have expected. And then uh, number two is how Cat- Cadillac is planning on partnering with the sport. So on number one, there's, you know, within the last couple of years, all the teams uh, came to a new agreement with F1 on the kind of the conditions of a new team joining. And I think there's up to room for up to two more teams. So a 24 car it's in the, grid. It's in the rules. Like they can have yeah. another couple of teams in. So what's yeah. the problem? 
So the teams still have to vote for it, right? And they have to approve it. Um, when they did that agreement, they set the expansion fee at $200 million. So that, you know, probably a few years ago felt like a lot of money in the way that F1 has grown even since then. And they're looking around at other sports like the NHL and, um, and other leagues who have recently updated their expansion fees to like 500, 600 million. I think that if you're, you know, the teams uh, in F1, you're thinking, man, 200 million doesn't cut it anymore. You know, we, we, if you want to uh, come into the sport, you're going to need to bring more money to the table, even though that's not what's in the rules right now. So it's a bit of a kind of uh, jockeying between the teams and, and then F1 uh, about how much to, uh, how much does each team need to pull in uh, in order to overcome the dilution of adding the team? Is it as simple as like, it's just a, a negotiation piece or is it that they're like, no, you like, this is not the way we want teams to come in is under these circumstances. And do you think that there is a natural pushback against, I mean, is there like some American team hate or what is it? As an American, it really feels like that sometimes, you know, that like Andretti, like what, give me another name in the world that, you know, you'd probably be more excited about from a branding perspective to join your racing, you know, league. Right. And so, you know, Andretti a few years ago expressed interest in wanting to join F1 and they said, oh, well, no, you need to bring a manufacturer. So he goes and he brings a manufacturer and they're like, well, no, you need to bring more money than we said you needed. It just feels like it's a moving target. Uh, and kind of sucks for Andretti <laughs> on the, on the other piece, it, it's that um, the teams don't love that Cadillac is essentially just going to rebrand Renault engines. Um, so there's, you know, limited engine suppliers in F1. And so people buy engines from other, you know, from the other teams that supply engines. And the, the plan was that they would come in and Cadillac would essentially buy in buy engines from Renault, rebrand them as Cadillac engines, and then they would, you know, race. And what the teams want is that if a manufacturer is going to come in, that they actually bring new technology, that they're actually doing the development. Um, and it's, uh, they're actually like making contributions and investment into the league is what the teams are saying. Um, I personally am like, well, in the end, it's all marketing. So it, you know, it's not like this is an engine that's going in your uh, CTSV or something. Well, no, like, no, that's a, and well, <laughs> and the logic of that and kind of the hypocrisy of that is too. You have multiple teams across the grid that have uh, engines that are from other manufacturers, and while they don't necessarily say this is a Haas engine, you know, like I, 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 I mean, this is what we, they do. They and what would they expect a brand new entrant into the sport to bring? Technology wise, like what what on earth would they want? Hey, we're we want to get back into the sport, and we have this brand new technology that's going to make the cars go even faster here. When you're brand new to the sport, that's exactly what you are. You're probably going to get your butt handed to you for a few years till your engineers get their feet under themselves. And so, um, I you know it's interesting too because a, but you and I had both talked about this probably days before our last episode, days before the news dropped about Cadillac and Andretti combining forces, like. It was now G, like it would be crazy to us that Ford or GM wouldn't jump in. And we talked about, you know, ah, you know, you have this Chevy brand and the Corvette brand maybe that could be involved with that or even Ford and uh, in their racing heritage. And instead they went with Cadillac. And I, from my from my experience here in Utah, they have the Larry H. Miller Motorsports Park, right? I got invited mm -hmm. to an event to an event years ago. It was probably a dozen years ago when I was uh, a reporter, and we went out to this racing event. They had us sit in a couple of these uh, of these cars that were racing, and it was I don't even know what I, I didn't even know what LTM was. Like I didn't know what oh. <laughs> I, I didn't yeah. know what, what these cars were, what they represented. I was just like, yeah, I'll go to this thing. They asked us to go out. We we took some footage, fine. But Cadillac had racing a racing outfit out there. And I thought it was so cool to see the Cadillac racing. I was like, those are things I just have never seen next to each other. And they handed some swag out. And I remember, like, to this day, my wife and I still both have these Cadillac racing shirts that I'm like, I saw the Cadillac jumped in and I went, oh, my goodness, these guys, they have, they have the money to back it. They have the name and Andretti to back it. They have all these things that you would need. I mean, Cadillac jumping in. How is that different than or not as good as even some of these other, you know, think about these other teams that don't have nearly the support that, that I think a racing division from an American 
massive company would be able to bring. I don't know. Maybe I'm just being a homer about it and, wonder, and wishing that they would have been a little bit more open to it. Yeah, no, I feel the same way. It's not really making sense to me. I mean, Volkswagen with their um, the Volkswagen Group, with their partnership um, and purchase of Sauber to, to come into the sport in 2026, yes. they're going to be making their own engines. So it, I don't know. I, I think that something gets settled and Andretti still enters. But I it, I think in the end, the m- more important piece is that the uh, teams are sitting back and thinking, how valuable is F1 right now? How valuable is two spots on the grid? And is it really only $200 million to, to uh, pay to play? And, uh, I, you know, we're seeing that too with the news that um, last year, supposedly Saudi Arabia tried to buy F1 from Liberty Media and for a reported $20 billion. <laughs> and they, they said no. What? Uh, and, you know, it's a big question. Like how much is F1 worth right now? They bought, um, Liberty Media bought F1 for $4.5 billion in 2017. Then, you know, a few years later, how many years later are we now? Almost six years later, they're, uh, are they $20 billion? You know, the, the, the stock is actually publicly traded, something I didn't realize until recently. Huh. But like the, the, the Formula One stock is publicly traded under a, a Liberty Media ticker and its current market cap is $30 billion. And you have recently last week, uh, Ben Suliam, the, the CEO of F1 saying like, you know, everyone needs to maybe like uh, tamper their expectations. It's, 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 the the price for Formula One at 20 billion feels a little inflated, which well, like, I don't know what CEO in the world <laughs> wants to, like, to be like saying, you know, uh, no, we're not worth as much as somebody that's wild. Is yeah. reportedly to well, offer. It's hard too, because you, uh, the way it works in other sports franchises. And, and the only thing that I kind of have to go off of is the ma- more mainstream stuff. But like here in the United States, you have the changing of hands of, of, uh, of, of sports franchises it doesn't happen very often. And when it does, the time between when one gets sold, it's massive speculation. And it is whatever it is. Like, you know, the market bears it out, like w- what a team is going to be worth. Here in Utah, the Jazz uh, sold for what, $1.5 billion, or was it $2 billion? Mm-hmm. I, can, it, I think it was like $1.5, $1.6. Right, and that seems pretty low now, considering what, what uh, you know, sports franchises and NBA franchises would be worth. Because I think that the Suns, uh, if I'm not mistaken i'm going to look it up while we're kind of uh is it like a, it was like two and a half or over two billion right the uh sons? four billion four four billion oh, is, is what they're t- yes <laughs> and so what you're saying is is that but it but it was but what you're saying in your head what one and a half maybe two and the answer is no it's whatever somebody's willing to pay for it right and so if somebody goes i want to buy this for 20 billion dollars Suliam can say it's not worth that, but as soon as the Saudi group said it's, we'll pay you twenty billion dollars, it's worth that much. So yeah. you could say that it's that it's not, but the the reality is is that you know that's that's how these things work. But I, I yeah, I, and it, it's I, funny to watch. Credit to guys. Liberty Media for looking at oh you know five year IRR on or you know four billion to twenty billion not bad. world private equity. That's that's a <laughs> that's a winner. That's a great investment, and the, you know they see like lots of runway and value to be created. So good for them for not just kind of selling out. To yeah. And I think it, the, it, the it's just going to get the, bigger. Yeah. It's yeah, just going to get bigger. Yeah. It's just going to get more uh, massive. And I think that opening up a real American team, you've got three races in America this year. And then you tell the American team, well, we don't know if we want to let you in. It's like, come on. But Ford has also been a name that's been floated out there and the possibility of being uh, related to, or in the family of Red Bull. How does that work? Yeah, uh, it's interesting because Red Bull, there were previous reports that Porsche was trying to get involved uh, with like a majority ownership stake in Red Bull and Red Bull said, no, thank you. We want to you know stay independent. And then now the rumors, you know, Ford wanting to work with them uh, uh, as a um, like a, a, a marketing partner and taking over their powertrain program from Honda. So I think that would be really interesting as a way for Ford to get in. Uh so hopefully that pans out because I think that would would be really great as well for for American Formula One fans to be able to get behind another team like Red Bull that's you know quote unquote American powered. Yeah. Um, any other team movement or any other uh, movement inside the world of F one that would affect uh, what the consumption of this would be or what what it looks like here? Because in the end, uh, you did have a couple of bosses that needed to be replaced at some of these teams. What are the uh, what are the names that have moved into some of these seats at some of these teams? 
Yeah, um, I think just recently they, in the last couple of days, they announced the new Alfa Romeo boss, um, Alessandro Aluni Bravi, which what a wonderful name. Um, I, <laughs> Congrats. Uh, we need to learn more about Alessandro, but uh, the boss uh, at uh, Williams came, uh, and I'm forgetting his name right now, but the new boss from uh, Williams is coming over from Mercedes and uh, a longtime um, engineer and you know technical strategist uh, from Mercedes uh, who had been there since you know Mercedes James came into the sport in 2011. James yes, Bowles. James Bowles. Yes. That's right. And uh, rumor, hot, uh, hot rumor online is that uh, he's taking a lot of engineering talent from Mercedes over to Williams. You know, they've and, had a weird, they've had an interesting relationship those two teams, and and uh, yeah. they've always been. It's almost like Mercedes has always been like the way big brother of of Williams mm-hmm. in, a, in a strange way, or like the, maybe it's more like the uh, the really nice uncle who like periodically <laughs> throws crumbs to him or something, but. If you right. start to steal some talent away, then you're talking about uh, a little bit more than just that. Yeah, it could get, could get testy. Yeah. And I, you wonder with like the technical partnerships that they have, how much information sharing happens there. Um, you know, by the rules, there shouldn't be any, but it's it's really hard <laughs> to I regulate that stuff. At least in NASCAR, it was, um, you know, pretty well known that, you know, people would move between teams and they take their notes with them, like in all their prior knowledge. And it's just... Uh, it, it's hard to really isolate that stuff. So uh, it seems to me that Williams is making, you know, with the new ownership, making big investments into upgrading the team and, uh, you know, probably paying a pretty penny for good talent from, you know, Mercedes are, you know, arguably the best uh, team on the grid from the last decade. So uh, I think it's exciting. It, who knows how long it'll take for, you know, this new talent to actually make an impact in the way, you know, the performance they get on the track. But I think it's the future is bright for Williams to at least, you know, uh, improve from how the last few years have been uh, on the side of the actual car development. And this is something we won't, you know, actually know until we see some tires on the, and some uh, actual, you know, stopwatches being uh, ticked around the, around those tracks. Uh, there are always rumors about how teams are doing. And I, I saw that Fred Vasseur was like, reliability is totally under control now. And we're fast. Rumors are that Ferrari is is uh, making a real push in year two. While disappointing year one, they might be able to make a real push here and maybe even be the favorite going into the season. Yeah, uh, strong rumors around their speed that they've been able to pick up in the sim. And, uh, and a rumor out there that they're one second per lap, uh, per lap faster. I don't know. Who you know where then that comes who? from? <laughs> yeah, the, new Cadillac, the, that? the new Cadillac team. I don't know what they're talking about. Yeah, yeah. So uh, you know, a second lap is significant. Wow. Yeah. Uh, and uh, there's really interesting uh, Twitter account out there called uh, F1 Data Analysis, and there's a thread that um, that he did in this last week, we're breaking down. You know, where do you get one second when you take into consideration the new rules for this year with a higher floor? Um, you know, they had, you know, uh, suspected that was going to slow the cars down like a quarter second this year. So they've really, they being Ferrari really picked up like a, a second and a quarter. And um, that that's m- most likely coming from horsepower gains. Uh, and, you know, Ferrari was really fast uh, at the beginning of the year. And then, the, then they had the reliability issues so and yeah. they supposedly, you know, tuned it down. So if, uh, if they're saying that they've got the, the reliability stuff figured out, then, you know, hopefully we're seeing Ferrari as quick as they were at the start of last year, if not more. So that's really exciting. And then um, on the development side, another, uh, you know, news sounds like Mercedes is sticking with the zero side pod uh, design that they launched with last year. And there's a lot of speculation last year that Mercedes troubles were because of that zero side pod design. that was just like, wasn't a good aero plan. Uh, but they've repeated time and again, that uh, they, they, don't relate to the issues last year with uh, the zero side pods. And they still believe that that's like the design thesis, you know, going forward for the, for the next uh, while. So we will expect to see Mercedes still with a slim downside and hopefully they can have fixed their other stuff uh, that they needed to, to fix last year. Leave it to our guy, Dan, to, uh, to follow a Twitter account that is F1 data and analysis. Is that what it is? It's like the, <laughs> what's it called? Then I'll know yeah, what, like, what I won't, then I'll know what to follow that I won't be able to understand. It's like, like I mean, there's a lot of deep F1 data analysis. Yeah. What, what, what he does is he, um, you know, has access. I, I think if you're a Formula One subscriber or something on F1.com, you get access to more data, like publicly available data from the cars. Wow. And so, um, you know, they, yeah, F1 data analysis, that's what it is. Um, if, uh, yeah, so he'll, he'll take all that data and 
put it into really interesting data visualizations to see like, okay, what cars are faster, where kind of breaks down everybody's performance and gives, you know, previews of like, okay, how did everybody perform in practice on their different kind of stints? And so it's a, it's a really great, um, really great Twitter account. If you want to nerd out more on, on more of the kind of performance of each of the cars and the drivers. And uh, this time of year, I mean, there's how much of it is. And again, most of it I have to go off of in terms of off season, preseason, I mean, we're, we're getting closer because you're, we're a month and a half out or a month and a week away from the start of the season. And so, you know, I think about it like in football terms, uh, it, it, where you have like kind of fall camp going on, you have camp, you're like kind of walking up, but the coaches also put up the big, uh, the big black, uh, you know, sign so you can't see what's going on in practice. And so there's, there's quite a bit of that going on because it's one thing to share, Hey, here's what we're seeing in the sim. At the same time, you have a lot of nothing coming from other teams because they don't want to share stuff right now. Yeah. Yeah. It's surprising that any information gets out at all. Honestly, you'd think that everybody would be super quiet. You know, we're coming into um, car reveal season through February. It seems like every you know week there's going to be one or two teams revealing their new cars. And, you know, there's, you know, some that you're going to, each of the teams will be able to learn about the other teams when they, you know, show off their new car designs. But at that point, you know, you're kind of, um, you know, you've made your bed and that you're going to have to sleep in for the first half of the year. And so you, the teams can't really react uh, in a significant way if they see something wild from Red Bull or Mercedes that they didn't expect it, that they didn't expect previously. So, and you never know how that stuff's going to translate to the track. You know, I think when everybody saw the zero side pod design from Mercedes last February, they thought, oh my gosh, these guys are going to be a bullet. And then you get to the <laughs> testing and they're like, wow, these guys suck. These guys are slow, uh, man. So you, you, like you said, you, you don't, you never know until you get out there on the racetrack. So um, it, it'll be fun to see the cars, especially the liveries, to see if anybody does anything fun. Like if Red Bull comes back with like the same Red Bull livery from the last 10 years, I don't know. It's, <laughs> they got to get a little <laughs> bit more creative there, uh, uh, but we'll uh, hopefully we'll see um, some new fun designs and I hope the Ferrari stays the same because I think that's the best. Well, and obviously you can't get better than last year's reveals of those cars because it was a totally new everything and it was you're looking at, at an alien, you know, like something that was only, mm -hmm. you know, thought of, of uh, or, or, you know, theoretical and everybody was given these guidelines and then just said, go to work. And then to see how everybody kind of came out with it was interesting, but uh, it'll be interesting to see some of the tweaks this year and what people do bring uh, with all that. So uh, just right before we wrap up things here, Dan, I was looking at some of these drivers and I was looking at is, is the best version of this next year that max, isn't super dominant again. I mean, obviously nobody wants to see a super dominant racer, but is it still Max's world and everybody else is living in it? Or uh, are we going to see other names? Is this where Ferrari breaks through? Is this where Charles Leclerc finally breaks through? Do we see a different champion in 2023? Um, you know, Max is the odds on favorite for sure. Uh, I think that uh, it, it'll take a few years with the, with the big regulation change from last year that it'll, it'll take a few more years for folks like McLaren or, 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 um, you know, kind of those more mid, uh, mid pack, uh, teams to catch up. But I, I, I think that if Ferrari can fix their reliability issues, sounds like they fired their chief strategist, like just the self-inflicted wounds, like they can get rid of that stuff. They absolutely can fight for that championship. And then I think M Mercedes isn't down and out. And I think Lewis is as hungry as ever to win that eighth championship and kind of put, all questions aside of when who's the best driver in formula one of all time. So I'm really excited. I think the, the top three are going to be really competitive. Uh, and you know, you might see a lot of Fry Red Bull Mercedes wins and not, you know, a ton of McLaren or, or, um, uh, Alpine wins, but I, I expect a more competitive, uh, year than last year for sure. What about our guy? What about Alonzo at Aston Martin? That's going to be another, uh, world championship for uh, for Fernando, man. It's just going to be amazing. Yeah, I just can't wait to see him um, <laughs> fighting with his teammate. I know. I just can't wait to see him pretend like he likes to be there and isn't there for the money and just to try to uh, be yeah, there. Him. That's a bummer because he probably stepped back uh, in terms of a performance from a car. So there's uh, there's always yeah. that. Uh, and Lance are going to be fighting. With him. For oh, sure. Yeah. All right. Uh, for Dan Jimenez, Alex Curie, we will be back again for another edition of Mode Push. When the season drops of Drive to Survive, we're going to be there. We'll do your first five episodes, and then we will drop the next five episodes with a race preview as well. 
But Dan, something tells me that uh, we should also just try to figure out another episode even before then to kind of jump in and get everybody's uh, appetite. I mean, for the at the very least, we we want to have it done just so we can re- still talk about F1 until the uh, season starts up here. Okay. So for Dan Jimenez, Alex Curie, we'll be back again. Mode push right here. KSL Sports, KSL Podcasts.